This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by the new book Monsters of the Week, the complete critical companion to the X-Files by Zach Handelin and Todd Vanderwerf. XFilesNews.com writes, Monsters of the Week is the book version of every Sunday night that you sat down to watch the show and then discussed it with your friends. Whether you agree with all their opinions or not, it's truly refreshing to read a collection of reviews by people that devoted great appreciation for the object of their examination. Learn more about the book over at AbramsBooks.com. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 331 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the various artists who have brought the world of Dungeons and Dragons to life over the past 45 years. And I'm joined by two guests. So, first up, we've got Michael Whitwer who you may remember from our panel on the history of Dungeons and Dragons back in episode 170. He's the author of the book Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons, and co-author of the new book Dungeons and Dragons, Art and Arcana. So, Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Thrilled to be back. And also joining us today is Brian Stillman, who you may remember from our panel on the business of Star Wars back in episode 126. He's the director of the documentary film Plastic Galaxy, The Story of Star Wars Toys, and co-director of the new documentary Eye of the Beholder, The Art of Dungeons and Dragons. So, Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And today's show is brought to you by the new book Monsters of the Week, the complete critical companion to the X-Files by Zach Hanslin, author of If You Like Money Python, and Todd Vanderwerf, critic at large for Vox. And here's a description of the book. It says... In Monsters of the Week, on the occasion of the show's 25th anniversary, TV critics Zach Handelin and Todd Vanderwerf unpack exactly what made this haunting show so groundbreaking. Witty and insightful reviews of every episode of the series and both feature films leave no mystery unsolved and no monster unexplained. This crucial collection even includes exclusive interviews with some of the stars and screenwriters, as well as an original foreword by X-Files creator and showrunner Chris Carter. This complete critical companion is the book about the X-Files, the definitive guide whether you're a lifelong viewer wanting to relive memories of watching the show when it first aired, or a new fan uncovering the conspiracy for the first time. So again, the book is Monsters of the Week, the complete critical companion to the X-Files by Zach Handelin and Todd Vanderwerf, and you can learn more over at abramsbooks.com. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is I think it's interesting that this documentary and this book about the art of Dungeons and Dragons are both being created now. So I'm curious, is there a reason for that? Is there something in the zeitgeist that is bringing the art of Dungeons and Dragons to the fore? So, uh, Michael, what do you think about that? I think absolutely. Um, In a general sense, I think it's safe to say Dungeons and Dragons is blowing up in every possible way, and it's becoming more and more mainstream every day. And I think it's very natural when that happens that uh, people take a deeper look at not just how it all came about in a foundational sense, but all of the individual components and art being a very, very foundational and important part of how this all came about. Mm-hmm. How about Brian? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I think what we're seeing is D&D is becoming as much a lifestyle brand as just a game as a, or as a hobby. Um, I think that, you know, like like Mike said, people want to know what's going on with it. People want to understand the bigger picture, I think, with it, now that it's something pervading their lives the same way, you know, Star Wars does or Disney does or Marvel does, which, of course, are all Disney things. But, you know, this idea that it's a bigger um, part of pop culture than just simply a thing that people, you know, hang out with their friends and play. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been working on this documentary? Oh, um, it's roughly three years. We're we're really at the end of this thing. Uh, the movie's finished. We just signed a distribution deal, um, so it's it's pretty much on its way out the door. Um, so yeah, it's been a while, but uh, you we'll just see the light pre- you at just the end premiered of the it, right? Yeah, we did a premiere at Gen Con uh, in the Gen Con Film Festival, and uh, it went over really well. Uh, it was nice to see. It was a slightly rough cut, but. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the first showing. We're doing it again at a uh, convention next week, and uh, we've got a few other screenings coming up. But mostly we're concentrating at the moment on just getting this thing out the door to the distributor. Yeah. And how about, Michael, how long have you been working on Art and Arcana? Yeah, this was about two years in development. Um, my colleague and co-author, Kyle Newman, had come to me very interested in doing – 
a really comprehensive art book about the brand. Um, and uh, I, of course, uh, pulled in one of my dear friends and colleagues, John Peterson, who's really kind of uh, kind of one of the key historians in the space, uh, who wrote another a, a very brilliant book a few years ago called Playing at the World, where he really kind of set uh, the bar for what um, role playing game history was all about. Um, a few years later, as you mentioned in the introduction, um, I worked on a book called Empire of Imagination. Uh, so all this is to say we built this team uh, that we thought we could execute this project in a reasonable period of time. Uh, but we also knew going in that we knew many of the pieces we would need to know to get started, right? We weren't starting from scratch. John has been working on RPG history for, for 10, 15 years and uh, me about five years myself. So we knew where to start, but we had never thought of uh, the history through this lens before. So the, it, the art part was novel. And, and I remember John and I kidding about the notion that, boy, I wish we knew we were doing this project three, five, ten years ago. All the questions we could have asked, all the art we could have gathered while we were doing this other work we were working on. So um, <laughs> the answer to your question is about two years total, but there was kind of a lot that, that goes into that. And that's the thing. That's funny. You know, you mentioned that, Mike, and that's the same. These aren't things that. I don't think you can do projects like these cold. I think it has to be something that you have some immersion in to begin with. You know, I've been gaming since the eighties, um, you know, and the art was something that was always part of my life. So when the time comes to do a project like this, you already kind of know, um, you've already done a certain degree of pre-production, whether you realize you're doing it or not, you know, the artists you want to talk to, you know, the stories you want to tell um, Mike's case, you know, the history of the game, you know, the history of Gary and all these other people. So it's, it's, you know, you work on it sort of specifically for two, three, whatever years, but it's always kind of percolating in the background. I mean, did your paths cross at all in the past couple of years? Cause you must've been talking to a lot of the same people and getting, trying to get rights to the same pieces of art and stuff like that. Well, yeah, but the funny thing is our paths crossed because Mike had written, you know, we go to the same conventions, you know, we we're both at GaryCon, I think, when we first spoke. And I don't I don't think you had even started working on this yet. You were still doing stuff with uh, Empire and I had just started to work on this. So I don't think they really actively crossed while we were working on these given projects. Um, I, I think that's right, Brian. Um, we were, I remember distinctly when we met and we went to one of the same panels, which was on early D and D artists, uh, yep. because we were both interested, no doubt for different reasons at that point. Uh, and it wasn't a particularly well attended panel, interestingly, which is funny because just yeah. a few years later, these are panels that are filling up standing room only. But at the time, uh, even just a few short years ago, uh, this was still a little bit abstract, uh, for most people. And, and Brian and I were two of the only people there. It was funny. We were sitting there and I remember it was being filmed by um, the guys doing Dorks of Yore and the only people asking questions. I remember the audience was La or the panel was like Larry Elmore, Jeff Easley, um, Bill Willingham was there. Jeff D. Was, uh, Jeff wasn't there. Uh, Diesel was there. And uh, they were like, all right, any questions? And like, nobody's asking any questions. Um yeah. Same with the Tim Cast panel, which I thought was strange that same year. No one's asking questions except the few journalists in the room who are also giant nerds. Well, so, yeah, so so all these guys are, are out there and are available, I guess, to, to talk to. Could you talk about how many interviews did you do? Like, how many of these people did you talk to? Um, uh, a lot. <laughs> um, they're, the artists are all, all around, and, and I think... Um, What's interesting, you know, off the top of my head, I think we interviewed 20 something artists, um, but we tried to cover the the full scope of uh, D&D art. So we interviewed a lot of people from the early days and a lot of people working on the game today and people in between. We wanted to show this kind of continuity. But what I find really interesting is when we first started the project, I met Diesel LaForce, who's an early Dungeons and Dragons artist. Um, I met him at Gen Con. And uh, I mentioned I was thinking of doing this thing and he got all excited because there are other people who have done things on D&D &D in the past, um, short documentaries, there's productions on a long documentary. And he remembers talking to some filmmakers who said, oh, you're one of the artists. Do you think we should do something on the art? And Diesel was like, yes, of course. And I find that sort of amazing because to me, the art and the game were so integrally tied together. They were... 
I bought the books not just to learn how to play the game. I bought the books because I love the art. So this idea that there are all these artists out there willing to talk to people, happy to talk to people. Um, and then I'm realizing, but no one's really reaching out to them. No one's trying to get their story. And, and that just sort of surprises and shocks me. It's like, I can't understand how people can see them as sort of two separate things uh, at this point. It's funny when you say that you bought the books as much to look at the art as, as to play the game. I was talking to um, a friend of mine recently. He was saying the same thing that he, you know, he's he's collected all these books. And I think it was like his mom or something said, you know, just admit it. You like you mostly like to look at the pictures and imagine what it would be like to play the game. Sure. Uh, and I mean, I you know, I personally, I mean, I I must have as a teenager, I must own something like two hundred dollars worth of D&D paraphernalia per session. I actually ever played the game. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. So I'm 43 years old. So when I was growing up, there was no internet. There were no books collecting this art. There was no, you know, anything. If you, there were no museums dedicated to this. If you wanted to see this stuff, you went to the game section and you went to the science fiction and fantasy section and you either looked at book covers or you started pulling game books off the shelves and flipping through the pages with your friends. You know, we'd sit in the back of Walden books just taking up space, not buying anything, <laughs> flipping through the pages and just freaking out over this cool stuff that at the time you couldn't see anywhere else. Um, you know. Amen to that. I mean, I, I'm, I like Brian uh, and yourself, David. I mean, I used to sit and pour over these books for hours. This, this was the imagery of my childhood. Um, and, you know, it's important to note that by the 1980s, you know, the D&D fantasy art was was really kind of the pinnacle of fantasy art. There wasn't better fantasy art out there, uh, which is a very big change from just a few years earlier. Um, you know, and it, it really kind of uh, set into motion kind of a much bigger movement. But I remember distinctly sitting uh, in my brother's room, pouring over specifically um, Jeff Easley's covers from uh, the 1983 through 1986, um, AD&D books like uh, Unearthed Arcana from 85 uh, with The Wizard, which, which interestingly is, is the, the referential piece that I used on the cover of Empire of Imagination. I actually got Jeff Easley to do that cover, which was a version of that same wizard with Gary, you know, at his typewriter instead of at the wizard book. Um, I remember the 1983 Dungeon Master Guide, another Easley painting. Um, and it's interesting, you know, it's funny. I remember all of the stigma even tied around the game at the time. Um, and they were such immersive pieces. I believe it or not, I, I've never said this before in, a, in an interview, but I remember being even afraid to look into the eyes of either the wizard for Unearth Arcana <laughs> or the dungeon master that has the, the big doors open on the DMG from 1983, fearing that that because these books were somehow tied in with Satanism, that I might somehow become possessed or immersed uh, within this this uh, unholy world. <laughs> well, what's funny is those Easley covers came about because it was D&D &D pushing into a more mainstream market. You know, you had the Tramp cover for the players, the Trampier cover for the player's handbook ahead of time. You had the Sutherland cover for the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual, and they were great, but they were rough. They were, they were not of the caliber that people like Easley, Elmore, Caldwell, and Parkinson kind of brought to the game. And D&D &D was saying, we need to, com if we want to get into bookstores, if we want to get into toy stores, if we want to get out of hobby shops, we need to compete with the fantasy art that you're seeing on the shelves, you know, Boris Vallejo and, and, um, and Frazetta and things like that. So they bring in these great paintings. And yet, meanwhile, as they're doing all this stuff to make it more mainstream, I mean, they get rid of deities and demigods and replace it with legends and lore because they don't want to mention deities or demigods. They do all this stuff. And that's when the satanic panic hits. You know, it's like they they sort of thrust themselves out into the mainstream so that the mainstream could look at it and go, whoa, 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 be gone, devils, which is crazy. <laughs> um, and then it scares people like Mike, which is weird, but OK. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm right there with you, Mike. I mean, I, uh, you know, I first heard of Dungeons and Dragons in the context of this is a game. And if your character dies in the game, you're required by the rules to commit suicide. And... <laughs> Uh, and I was like, in a weird way, I was like, wow, this game must be really awesome if people are that dedicated to it. You know? <laughs> That's, um, oh, man. No, I mean, when you're a young kid and there's this kind of rhetoric being, you know, kind of passed around the game, you, you just can't help but be intrigued by it, of course, but also somehow kind of afraid, right? It was secret knowledge somehow. You know, I was just a little kid when I'm looking at these books. But, man, I mean, this was a real thing and it was in the back of your mind that should I be playing this game? Is this... Is this okay? And and again, the art really 
uh, as Brian suggested, the art really brought you into that. And, and the art, of course, um, have reacted a lot to this movement as well, which is um, a much broader topic, but it's certainly a very interesting one. Well, right. And, and the art, especially, I mean, I, I grew up mostly with second edition, but I had a, I think my cousin had some of the first edition stuff, which had like the, like a lot of the demons and, um, you know, like the naked, um, succubus and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah, there was something really, um, sort of dangerous, uh, about the, the imagery in the game. If you're a little kid. Yeah. It felt like something the older kids were supposed to be playing with. You know what I mean? When I was a little kid, when I first got into it in like first or second or third grade or whatever it was, you know, always through the older cousin or older brother. But it felt like this is the older kids game. And wow, we're really lucky to be kind of getting to dig into it and play it. Um, Because, yeah, some of the art was so like freaky and not quite transgressive. I wouldn't push it that far. But yeah, you have the naked succubus. I mean, that that was mind blowing to me as a the third grader or whatever. <laughs> and to that end, it feels like every kid somehow was Elliot back then, right? Every yeah. kid was sitting in the background watching their yeah. older siblings or cousins or brothers or whatever playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was kind of my experience. Although, uh, you know, my brother had to kind of experiment on, on me and, and, uh, and my friends being a few years younger because he had no one else to experiment with. So we, we were the guinea pigs and it worked out great for all of us, I think. Well, well, right. And as you were saying, back in the pre-internet times, I mean, like Dungeons and Dragons was the main source of sexy ladies. Uh, if you're, yeah, if you're 13, I mean, there's no, you know, yeah, there's no internet or whatever, uh, at least for me. I mean, I wasn't uh, brave enough or I didn't have friends who would ha- pass me a uh, Playboy or something. <laughs> you know what? Here's the thing. For all the talk about like the chainmail bikinis, and it's it was definitely a problem, you know, flipping through all those old books again, There's a lot more there. It's not like every page is this sort of half-naked woman in impossible armor and everything else. Um, There is certainly a lot of it, and it's nice to see the push away from that over the last couple editions of the game. But there was a lot of things like monsters and cool environments and bizarre weapons and all that stuff. And I always found as a kid, that's what I liked a little bit more. I don't know if I was just freaked out by like the women in the chainmail <laughs> bikinis. Um, but, you know, I was also reading comic books at the time, which were certainly not really known for their realistic representation of women back in the eighties and nineties. So I think to me, that was the less kind of uh, eye opening part. And it was more the just completely bonkers monsters that they were throwing out there. Um, that's what really caught my attention. Well, because even as a kid, I always assumed that all that the the sexy women were all sort of a marketing ploy because uh, it was aimed at teenage boys. But then from watching your documentary, it made it sound like maybe the artists liked drawing that kind of stuff. And the management was always sort of uh, uh, trying to <laughs> trying to keep it under control. <laughs> I think, I mean, without really asking management and, you know, asking, you know, and knowing what they would really cop to, I suspect, I suspect they had to be aware that it was, had a powerful marketing because, or they wouldn't, they simply wouldn't have let Clyde Caldwell, who you're talking about, get away with it. They would have just said, no, redo it. Because by then they had art directors in place. Um, I think Clyde wanted to paint it. I think Larry Elmore wanted to paint that stuff. They were both really big pinup artists. And um, I think management for all their like, no, harumphing, harumphrumph, I don't think if they cared that much, they wouldn't have let it out there. You know, I think they recognized that it was a selling point, even as they kind of, you know, maybe said, well, my gosh, we we don't agree with this at all. Stick it on the cover, you know. (laughs) Well, and it was certainly based on, you know, keeping in mind that all these artists and certainly the designers of the game were so inspired by um, pulp imagery. A lot yes. of this stuff's actually really quite tame compared to really kind of the stuff it's, it's based on or that the culture that it emerged from, um, you know, this early pulp imagery in many cases is far more lewd than anything D and D ever put out. Um, you know, but again, most of the artists, especially as you get into the early eighties, these are people that are inspired by more uh, cultured artists like Frazetta and Vallejo. So, um, you know, I think they still start to get away from it more organically, but uh, there's no doubt that it was inspired by some pretty, you know, some, some pretty rough stuff that, that goes back very early, you know, to the 1940s, 30s, 20s, you name it. Well, yeah, Brian, I mean, you, you, see even tra- you trace it back 
even to like the to medieval art and uh, Renaissance art and stuff? Well, you know, we talked to artists about it, trying to get a sense of context. And yeah, I mean, if you look, yeah, you know, my wife and I were recently, well, not recently, a couple of years ago at the Prado in Spain, uh, the museum, and I'm looking at some of the medieval art and I'm like, yeah, that's totally a campaign I ran. I mean, <laughs> there's just no way to look at it and not see the illustrator at work, you know, the illustrative quality. It's just illustrating religious iconography or the fears of the time and things like that. Um, and then you take that into kind of the golden age of illustration, you know, the turn of the century, and you had monsters all over the place. You know, you had all sorts of cool stuff and you had fairy tales and things like that. And that starts to die off a little bit. And then there's this sea change. Well, you get people, you know, in the 40s and 50s, you start seeing comic book art, you know, golden age comic book stuff in the 50s. Um, and eventually you start seeing people like Roy Crankle, uh, J. Allen St. John, uh, I guess sort of flip those, J. Allen St. John, then Roy Crankle, and then Frazetta. And Frazetta changes everything. And uh, that's when you see this new kind of explosion of fantasy art. You've got Frazetta, you've got the Hildebrandts, you've got um, Boris, Vallejo, um, and then out of that emerges all the people influenced, you know, the, at the time, I mean, it was pretty much easily Elmore, Parkinson, Caldwell, uh, Bob Eagleton, a um, bunch of others. Um, but yeah, I think you can trace it back to the early days, um, like to hundreds of years ago, if you're just talking about sort of this manifestation, this manifestation of imaginative art, imaginative uh, uh, realism, so to speak. It just kind of depends on how you want to, define the parameters right well and, and i guess that all of us are probably too young to remember a time before dungeons and dragons but um nick parkinson i think was making the point that there was a period of time where you know you, the average person would not see really any fantasy art just going about their day-to-day -day life and that's not the case anymore and D, D was really the the first time that fantasy art really gets starts to get produced on any kind of like wide industrial sort of scale well, I mean, I think that's that's very safe um, in a lot of ways. Again, there's always exceptions, so you always have to be mindful of those. But um, I mean, one of the most stunning things that we tripped on in, in our research was when you talk to some of these original artists, you know, most of these people, um, you know, you think about the original Brown Box, the 1974 edition of D&D. &D. Who's Keenan Powell? Uh, who's Greg Bell? Uh, who's Cookie Corey? Who, who are these people? Um, you start to understand and realize once you look into it, well, Keenan Powell is Gary's sister-in-law and she was like 17 years old and she happened to be in town doing, you know, staying with them and, and it was at the right time. And Gary asked her to do these illustrations because she could draw a bit. Um, Greg Bell was a local kid from Rockford who was in some of Gary's games. And so these were, first of all, they were not trained artists. They were usually kind of these fantasy dreamers, most of them in high school age. And uh, Gary tasked them with some really, really interesting things, which is, hey, draw me a picture of a hippogriff. Draw me a picture of this thing that I'm going to call a beholder. And it's got 10 eye stalks on the top and a, and a giant peeper in the middle, he called it, uh, hmm. that fires anti-magic. You know, it, so, you know, these people had no context for, for even where to start. So, you know, uh, Keenan Powell, you know, in one of our interviews, you know, she talked about this notion of, okay, well, a, a hippogriff, okay, like, what are the components of that? Pulling out encyclopedias and, um, you know, different images of animals that she could kind of draw on to figure out the components of this particular beast. So uh, it was really a revolutionary thing, that this notion of D&D &D creating monsters, in many cases from scratch, or in other cases, actually providing um, kind of a standard visualization for what they would look like. It's it's actually one of the, the biggest things that D&D &D ever did was actually provide us, um, the, the, you know, kind of standardization of monsters as we understand them. Well, and you make the point that a lot of these artists were high school kids, uh, and they were also high school kids in some cases who were just sort of tracing comic books that they had. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that'd be the cover. That'd be uh, Doctor Strange 169, a panel that was basically ripped off to become the cover, the, the label that went on the brown box, the very first edition. They, they moved on from that pretty quickly. Um, because of the, I mean, it was, that was a problem. It's one <laughs> thing when you're releasing a game, 
out of your basement and selling, you know, a couple hundred copies at a game convention and nobody notices. But when you start to become an actual market force, you know, Marvel at the time, Marvel wasn't owned by Disney, but you still didn't really want to take them on. And Marvel in the 70s was flexing, you know, they had their power at that point. So I think it was probably a smart, smart move. Well, and I mean, and so this is an important, I'm actually glad you brought that one up because it's, it's a great um, context for how homebrew this whole thing really was, right? Greg Bell, again, first of all, he's a teenager, 17 years old. He's not even a professional artist. And Gary asks him on very short notice, by the way, which, which we can show through, through correspondence. On very short notice, Gary is asking Greg to put together, um, you know, 15, 20 images, including cover images for the original um, Dungeons and Dragons set, which is only a thousand copies, right? All hand assembled by Gary and his partner. So you're talking about a very homebrew effort. effort. You know, it is published, right? It's truly produced and it's meant for, for retail, but, but we're talking about, right, like mail order and very small hobby channels. So never meant to be an, on anyone's radar, radar in any way, shape or form when it came to visual IP or um, any other type of IP. So you get Greg Bell here you say, hey, Greg, I need next week, I need, you know, this many images and I'd like to see this, this, this and this. So he's sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh, <laughs> um, what am I supposed to do here? So you reference the only material you have because you don't have, as you suggested earlier, you don't have the Internet. You don't have Google. You don't have um, the monster manual that comes out three years later. So you um, you reference material you do know you have you happen to have strange tales next to you. And so you do a bunch of swipes, which, by the way, you know, so, so this concept of swiping, uh, very, very common in, in hobby channels. So this is also a really important context. And, and even, you know, well, common in, in comic, book, comic books as well. There are swipes <laughs> all over the place. I mean, it was done on the professional level, um, just not quite so prominently and, and obviously. Right. And, and I mean, again, it's, it's an important context that this wasn't considered – it wasn't something that, that, that people were saying, oh, this is a great thing. Look, I just, I just I took this image and made it into something else. But it was, it was very common. It was a very common thing to do, especially in hobby channels where you had gamers who were not professional artists, but they wanted to do pretty cool looking imagery. You take a comic book and you take Nick Fury and throw a different head on him or put a different weapon in his hand or whatever. And you'd have something that you could show your friends around the gaming table yeah. or maybe distribute it in some fanzine. But you, you wouldn't necessarily put it on the front of a box. And that's where the rubber hit the road here is that um, I think in context, you look back on this and say, oh, wow, they kind of stole all this imagery where really at the time it was kind of a very obvious thing for them to do. And uh, yeah, a really interesting story, no doubt. And it wasn't all that much. I mean, it, it, we talk about it today, I think, mostly because it was the prominent placement of that one piece. The truth is so much of that art was was original and yep. and great. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's funny we mentioned these guys were really young. You know, I talked to Diesel and he's like, yeah, I came basically out of high school. I was Ernie's friend, Ernie Gygax's friend. I worked in the in the mailroom, not the mailroom, in the warehouse. Turns out I could draw. So Dave Sutherland kind of pulls him up into the art department. But these guys were, were young and the art was rough. It was definitely fans doing art. But when you look at it now, Greg Bell in particular had a really distinct, identifiable style that I think you'd be remiss in simply kind of disregarding it. Um, it wasn't as refined from a technical point of view as people like Jim Rosloff or Dave Sutherland or certainly Trampier, um, people who came on board very soon after, but it's good in its own way and it's distinct in its own way and I think in many cases, really, really riveting. Um, I love his line work. Absolutely. It no, it's uh, Jake, to your point, right? There was, there was kind of a rawness in it, but it, it's very, um, it's very creative. It's very interesting. It's lizard man being a tremendous yeah. example, it, you know, so interesting and so iconic that it becomes the logo for the, for TSR um, yep. after its original uh, monogram logo. Well, right. And, and it's an aspect of all of that art that you can tell that it was done by different people. And mm. I guess, you know, that has upsides and downsides from a sort of, you know, production standpoint, but, but they are just all just like weirdly different and, and all have a unique voice. I think it's cool. I think it's, you know, one thing I loved as a kid was seeing the signatures and trying to figure out who was who. <laughs> um, and, you know, then you have your favorites and then a week later, someone else is your favorite and a week later, they're back to the other guys, your favorite. Um, but I think having those distinctly different pieces of art 
um, or styles of art, I guess, um, gave D&D a lot of character. You could say that the smart thing to do from an IP point of view would be to have a sort of more homogenous approach to the artwork, have one or two artists doing everything and really force them into a particular style. But I think, um, first of all, no one was really doing that. I don't think anyone could afford to have one artist do everything and the time constraints involved um, would have been crippling. But um, there's, it, it gets to the richness of the world when you see all these different styles, I think. It, it To me, as a kid at any rate, it hinted at this idea that there's all this crazy diversity of styles or of, of, of environments and of monsters and everything else. And that's kind of subconscious, but it's because of all the different types of artists working on things. It, it, it also, you know, as a gamer, this stuff is inspiring your imagination to not have a single image or a single style at play, um, I think helps you um, because then you can kind of better put your own stamp on things in your own mind as you're thinking about different monsters, different environments, different weapons, different armor, whatever it might be. So I think it all worked in favor. Yeah. Well, you even, you have these things by Errol Otis that look like something off of a, <laughs> skate, a skateboard or something. I mean, like really, really different art Or style. a fever dream. <laughs> I mean, Errol was fantastic. And yeah, distinctly different than the high fantasy we're used to seeing in kind of a Tolkien-esque world. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Brian. And Errol Otis, to me, is one of my certainly one of my top three, top five for, for sure. In terms of what he brought to the art, I mean, he was so distinct. Of course, you know, he's from Berkeley. He kind of brought this this San Francisco comic style paired with some Dr. Seuss. Uh, I mean, just some of the strangest things you've ever seen. You know, everybody else was pretty much a Frazetta person. Um, but he, here he brings in this this really strange, abstract style of, of kind of these adventurers that are not what you are used to, these brawny adventurers, right? They're these misfits, right? They're these really strange looking magic users and, and fighters and, and people that um, that on some level, I don't know if you could relate to them necessarily, but boy, they were interesting. And they, they certainly stretched the boundaries of what you could imagine an adventuring party could be. And that's what I think made his stuff so darn cool. They also pushed you outside of that framework when running and playing in your own games of that sort of typical high fantasy look um, and environment. And it makes you think, well, what if I put something totally bizarre here? Or what if the encounter is with something that's got like, you know, three mouths, four eyes and these weird tubes coming out of it? Like it, it, it breaks you out of the, the sort of pattern that's established by traditional fantasy. Um, and inspires you to go in kind of different directions. His color work, too. I mean, we think of Errol's stuff in terms of black and white a lot because of all the interior work. But mm -hmm. his color choices were so weird, like strange things that don't always blend together. They sit on top of each other in weird, disconcerting ways. Um, I, I, I'm a, I, I just love his work. The funny thing is I have a question for you, Mike, because you mentioned he's one of your favorites. I agree. Yep. As a kid... Was he one of your favorites? Because it took me a long time to really understand what made him so great. I wanted normal looking dudes when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and it was later that I went, oh, my God, this is beyond anything. Yeah, great question. I, I think when you grow up, uh, or at least when I grew up, you know, I think it was that was very easily, um, <laughs> easily, easily. And Elmore, <laughs> Parkinson, Caldwell. Uh, pretty much, you know, the big four that were doing all that tremendous art in the 1980s, the Dragonlance stuff. Uh, sure. There's no doubt that was my favorite growing up, to answer your question. Uh, but the Errol Otis art is probably the stuff on some level that, like, meant D&D to me more than anything else. Huh. And partly because we had the Moldvay box set, right? The 1981 Moldvay box set with okay. the Errol Otis art on the front. That's what D&D looked like if you were from that era. And, and that box set sold about as many copies as just about anything D&D &D ever sold. Um, so it was it, it was really, you know, something that you could associate with the game, uh, whether you thought it was the best art or not. Although I will tell you, his back of Tomb of Horrors, the face of the Great Green Devil yes. that, that Errol Otis did is, is probably one of my, it, that was always one of my top, you know, three top five pieces. I just think it's incredible. All right. So, Michael, I have to ask about it ask you about this. So speaking of Errol Otis, this is from your book. It says, the notorious first printing of the Palace of the Silver Princess, Module B3, <laughs> contained its share of controversial images, but perhaps nothing more transgressive than Errol's three-headed hermaphrodites with leering faces. Famously, the module mm -hmm. was recalled and pulped, and even years later, Executive Kevin Bloom would circulate a memo demanding that any remaining copies harbored by employees be destroyed. 
Yes. Yes, the, the, it all happened. It's all true. Yep. There are a number of panels from uh, Silver Princess that uh, management really didn't like. And so they ended up taking them out and um, they redid the module entirely. My recollection is um, they um, they kind of rewrote the module and they changed out a lot of the imagery. And so the original printing is an extraordinarily rare um piece of, of, of D&D ephemera, actually. There's only a handful of copies that exist and those that sell, sell for a ton of money. But that three-headed hermaphrodite is one of those images that was taken out, namely because it was, um, it was representing TSR executives. Uh, so that particular <laughs> pan- panel absolutely incensed uh, the management of TSR uh, because the three-headed hermaphrodite, my recollection, it's, I think it's Gary, um, Brian or Kevin Bloom, and maybe Mary Gygax. So it, it's, it, it did not sit well with the people at TSR, suffice it to say. And there was a bunch of other imagery in that particular piece that um, was uh, not well received by TSR. Well, the funny thing is, one of the pieces of art that they didn't like essentially depicted, and I know this was not the artist's intention, but essentially depicted what looked like might be a gang rape. Mm-hmm. Um, like bad, 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 bad. Um and that was done by Laura Rosloff, who's Jim Rosloff's wife. Um, she did a, some art for D&D, um, also worked in the Dungeon Hobby Shop. And I was talking to her before she passed away. She was like, that's not what I was thinking at all. And she, you know, said, I just saw it as like, you know, the sort of dangerous scenario and the adventurers would come in and do whatever they're going to do. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I was looking at it. It's pretty frightening. Um and so it wasn't just like kind of boys being boys. It was Laura was like, yeah, I just thought it looked cool. Um, and I know that one set a few people off. Um, it's also the only module. Um, as far as I know, it's the only module that was destroyed after being completely printed and warehoused and ready to go out the door. It's the only one they ever pulled. Uh, everything else, if it made it that far, went out. Um, and-, and a couple crates made it out from everyone I've talked to. A couple boxes made it out, and that's why uh, we see them today. So, was there no nobody nobody in editorial looked at it before? That's it? the that's the big question. Um, according to Diesel, after that, they quickly got an art director. <laughs> um, there, they these are a bunch of young people without a lot of oversight who were told there's a hole on this page, fill it. You know, you've got two inches, and it's right here. Um, here's the page if you want to read it for some information. That's how a lot of the art got made. And you had people like Dave Sutherland, who was an art director, but was also an artist and not an art director the way we think of it, not someone who's providing editorial oversight. It really wasn't, I guess, until, I don't know, Mike, like Jim Rosloff, I guess, came on as an art director and that they started to lock things down, but it was kind of freewheeling. And and that's how yeah. stuff like that got out the door. Nobody looked. I mean, it's crazy to think yeah. about it today. It's absolutely bonkers. But I mean, you know, it's the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. You have a bunch of young guys doing all this art, uh, mostly guys um, with a few exceptions. And they just thought it was fun. You know, they weren't looking to hurt anyone or freak anyone out. Although Errol with that drawing is <laughs> probably making a statement. Um, but yeah. Nobody thought and it, was, it was commonly done, you know, in that department, again, very few things actually got out the door, but there are other examples. But, but, you know, to your point, right, there wasn't a lot of oversight and absolutely Rosloff was really the first art director, you know, while Sutherland was in charge prior to that, Jim Rosloff, when he comes in after um, what they call, or I should say during, uh, and before the great purge, which yeah. was this, this incident where, um, frankly, you had a bunch of, of young, really kind of immature People, you know, working and doing fun things in the art, uh, not only just the art department, but the design and development department. And um, these people would kind of do their own thing and they were having fun and um, they would cross the line sometimes. And there weren't that many people that would bring them back. And so suffice it to say, if there was no one there to catch them in between, if this stuff reached management, in some cases too late, uh, it's not that surprising that it could happen. Um, But again, some of these guys lost their jobs over this type of thing and then others resigned uh, because they thought it was unfair or whatever. Again, there's, there's a kind of yeah. a lot to that story, but it's an amazing period because actually it was that kind of nonsense that led to really the golden age of D and D art. It was, it was that, uh, it was those incidents that actually ultimately led to basically this, this purge that they call it the great purge, uh, that led to the hiring of people like Larry Elmore followed by Jeff Easley and 
Keith Parkinson and Clyde Caldwell. And uh, that's around the time Diesel joins, gets on board, and Steve Sullivan gets on board. Um, this incredible art department that really becomes like the zenith of fantasy art, not just in, in gaming, but kind of anywhere. There's a funny thing in, in the film about this disconnect between the artists and management where uh, this directive comes down to uh, only this is a really important piece. Only use your most expensive colors on it. Yeah, that was a little bit later in the game. That was in the 80s. You had D&D &D under uh, under Lorraine at that point. And you had a lot of executives coming in who, according to these artists, really were not sort of keyed in as as much to the creative thing side of things. And you had money being spent way too much money being spent throughout TSR and their their sort of their priorities and how the money was being spent were a little strange and and I think their understanding of how these things worked were a little strange and the the missive came down um yeah use your most expensive colors or use all the colors you know i mean these sort of insane insane things oh you got to remember at the time TSR was paying for the art supplies um, so TSR is buying all the paints, TSR is buying all the brushes, all the everything. So their feeling was we want to get our money's worth, <laughs> um, which is nuts. But, you know, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I mean, certainly growing up, I mean, I loved all the artists uh, that Michael was just mentioning. I mean, like Larry Elmore, um, just his cover of the first Dragonlance novel, um, Dragons of the Autumn Twilight. I, mean, I just used to mm. just stare at that for hours and like dream about being able to paint something like that. <laughs> That's what uh, it was supposed to do. Oh, well, to dream of being able to paint something like that. Yeah. But to stare for hours and dream like this could be me. You know what I mean? Like that's that's what the art was supposed to do. And, and these guys knew how to do that. They knew how to suck you right in. No, I never thought I could be an, a half elf, but I thought maybe I could draw. I thought I could maybe draw a half elf. Eh, you never know. <laughs> Sharpen those ears. <laughs> well, I mean, by that time, again, when you're getting into the Dragonlance era in particular, uh, right, there was no limitations in terms of what these artists could execute. I mean, th that's what's really important is that these these particular people were really skilled, trained artists that all went to art school and had done it professionally before that. You know, many of them had done covers of or back covers of Heavy Metal magazine. Um, they were real deal artists. You know, before that, you know, you're talking about the certainly the Trampier and Sutherland era and, and before that. You know, uh, you're talking about people that kind of painted a little bit and they were self-taught largely. Um, and they, they had limitations in terms of what they could execute. But one thing I give them a tremendous amount of credit for, and the thing that was was really enlightening to me uh, as we went through our project over the last couple of years was, was this notion that they were tasked with not only doing the first of everything, right? The first beholder or the first mind flayer or whatever, and, and kind of setting the bar for those particular creatures. But but the actual the idea that, you know, what started as kind of like, let's illustrate what, you know, chain mail looks like. Let's illustrate what this weapon looks like. Let's illustrate what this monster look like, looks like turns into this idea of instructional art. The idea of let's use the art to help people understand the game, mm. understand what it is to play the game. And one great example that my team and I have poured over for, forever and talked about is, uh, you know, the cover of the Player's Handbook, the iconic cover of the Player's Handbook by Dave Trampier, you know, the Demon Idol, that, that beautiful wraparound cover. Uh, it was like the number one, it was like our number one objective when we started the project was to get that piece. And, and we did. Um, yeah. but seeing that thing and understanding it and realizing, you know, this isn't just a brilliant piece of art in terms of kind of what's in it. This is an instructional piece. This piece in a single shot will help bring somebody into the world of D and D, you know, it's a game very hard to explain to your colleagues, right? Trying to explain role-playing and the, the notion of it and the, the ideas about it. But when you look at that piece, you can say, oh, here's what happens in a game of D and D. Here's how it works. You have this diverse party that all specializes in different things. You have this kind of Gandalf person over here. You've got these warriors over here and there's the thieves over there and they're all doing different things and they all think different ways. But I mean, th the aftermath of that little lizard battle they've had in front of the demon idol is just the perfect illustration of what you can expect in a game of D and D. It teaches you so much about it before you even open the book. And I think that is what these early artists did so well. And that's one, one way they really took the game to the mainstream in a way that it couldn't have been done otherwise. And so, yes, like I said, I mean, I loved all those those artists, uh, Elmore and Caldwell and so on. But I think that my my favorite artist as a kid was Brom. Uh, yeah. I was really into the Dark Sun setting. And mm. I didn't know back then how um, 
you know, how much the setting was coming out of his uh, illustrations rather than, you know, the other way around. Uh, so that was really interesting to to find that out. He was, it was a definitely a different relationship than you had with um, a lot of the other settings where the writers and stuff were dictating things. Brahms art really was inspiring so much of that game, um, even to the point where they were trying to figure stuff out. They see this painting. You know, he told us that he he tried to pitch his style of painting to them on a lot of other things and wasn't really getting many places. Um, and they had him doing other stuff and kind of conforming his style to um, the typical D and D look. And he had uh, that that painting sitting behind his desk, the uh, Nila. And they walked by and they were like, "Boom! That's it. That's that's the look." Um, and it really just kind of fell in his lap. I mean, that's the short version of the story, but um, and became so influential moving forward. And after that. You see that happening in other places. You know, Planescape is the really big example of one artist or two artists kind of dominating the look. Uh, Tony DiTrilizzi and Rob Rupel on the covers, uh, Tony on the interior art, all which all came out of Dana Knutson's design. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of interesting how how that idea within TSR that we can start visually branding stuff shifts it gets away from what we talked about earlier which is this kind of diversity of styles um populating the game although they still did that with um the core books and the forgotten realm stuff yeah it becomes this dance right this dance between the art influencing the game the game influencing the art and these things Mm. really couldn't exist without each other i mean i think about something monty cook said you know he wrote uh an adventure based purely on the image of the paladin in hell that very famous full page Black and white, uh, Sutherland, uh, Paladin and Hell from the from the player's handbook, um, and again, it's it's so common because again, when you gr- when you grow up on this stuff and you you've poured over these things, they they inspire you, and so again, very early on, Gary uh, and Dave Arneson both understood how important it was to put uh, imagery to support this really strange fantasy game that they were putting out into the market that really required that you were like a war gamer already before you even understood how the hell you might play <laughs> this game. Um, and again, that imagery, it, while it's that really early stuff is crude, you know, it, it does, it's, it, it brings you, um, a, a little bit that, that having no imagery wouldn't, right? It brings you a little bit further into this world of fantasy and that goes, you know, and it changes a lot over time, but big picture, um, you know, the art, it, I think was very quietly a huge driving force behind the entire D&D movement from, from the very beginning all the way to today. Well, it makes sense to me in a way to start with the art and then develop the content out of that, because I feel like if you're just sitting down, you know, like so many times your best ideas come when you're just sort of doodling around and like, oh, I messed up. And what can I how can I make that into something that works? And, yeah, I feel like if you're if you're going to get into these more sort of out there settings like Dark Sun or Planescape, that uh, it would be hard to just sort of sit down with a blank piece of paper and come up with that. Whereas if you have somebody churning out crazy images you can say like oh like yeah let's go let's do that or let's do that well you have to remember it's all in the service of the players you know what i mean so as a kid like as a kid i used to pour over paladin in hell that thing freaked me out because this idea of being this lone knight in just the most unforgiving landscape you could possibly be in where everyone wants to kill you and you know as a kid i'm like my parents aren't anywhere near me this is terrible you know (laughs) on every level it's kind of horrifying and here's this guy who's going to just kick ass until he gets out of there um or go down trying (laughs) and that inspired me as a kid um in coming up with scenarios in the game you know or how i wanted to play my characters or you look at uh miracle um, the the <laughs> wizard who's riding on a horseback just zapping some dude uh, one of Trampier's pieces. Um, there's no story there. They just give you this cool art and they name the guy and tell you nothing else. But boom, that's something you can incorporate into your own game. You know, you can make up who he is. You can make up what he does. You can make up how your players might encounter him. Or maybe they encounter the aftermath of this guy or a town that lives in constant fear of him or something like that. <laughs> um, this game, this art, was inspiring us players to dig a little deeper in our imaginations, to to reach a little further in our approach to uh, embodying these characters and embracing this world in a way that no other game asks you to do. 
You know, this is creating a virtual reality. Um, that we can all then share. You know, if Mike and I are both playing and you suddenly say you encounter a beholder and we go, well, what, what the hell's a beholder? You show us a picture and now all three of us, we're in the same headspace. We get it. Um, and we know how to coordinate our attacks because we know where the eye stocks are. They're not all over the thing. They're just at the top. They're this, they're that, whatever. Um, so the art was really important. And, I, you know, it's it's important to not lose sight of it as a mechanical tool. For, for playing this thing. You know, it, it, if I could piggyback right on that, right, visual u- uniformity in a game that could otherwise be is played as a spoken conversation, right? Mm-hmm. It's a unique game because you don't actually need the miniatures. You don't need a lot of things. You can play this game there with your pencil and paper and your dungeon master and your dice. Um, and so where does the art come into that? And visual uniformity becomes a really important part of it, especially when they have developed a lot of new monsters um, when yeah. they've developed a lot of new concepts that people were not familiar with. Um, that was a huge part of the game. And actually I, I point to something that was one of um, I think the single most exciting things that we landed on uh, in, in the course of, of art and Arcana was uh, when we landed on the 1975 uh, tomb of horrors, original tournament module. And, uh, and it sounds like an odd connection, but, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So um to not go too deep on how these original tournaments would work. Um, in 1975, uh, Gary decides to put on uh, the Tomb of Horrors tournament. And that is the same Tomb of Horrors that many, many uh, Dungeons and Dragons players would know and recognize. It was published a few years later, I believe in 1978, uh, became the most infamous module of all time. It, it killed more <laughs> player characters than any other module, I'm sure. Uh, and there, by the way, there was a reason for that. It's because it was actually originally designed to be a tournament. Uh, that is to say, they needed to actually establish winners, and so it needed to be uh, very necessarily very deadly. So the 1975 Tomb of Horrors module uh, was something that, that Gary had written, out uh, hand-drawn map, the whole thing. Uh, and before he left, about, I don't know, about six weeks before he left for Baltimore, which is where this or- Origins tournament took place, uh, where they were going to run this module for about 120 players uh, with four dungeon masters. So... Gary came up with this idea that, well, gosh, if I've got four different dungeon masters running the same module and I've got people that haven't played this game and it's supposed to be a tournament. So it's supposed to be fair and actually competitive in a way. Right. There's going to be winners and losers and the whole thing. But how do I how do I make sure this is really uniform? So he came up with this idea about creating panels that he could show players and that he could distribute among the four dungeon masters so that they could have visual uniformity about what they saw and what they experienced. And so that's how the 24 original panels from Tomb of Horrors came about. And Gary leaned on, as I'd mentioned, a lot of these people were untrained locals that they kind of, whoever they could find. In this case, uh, uh, Gary had conscripted one of his uh, daughter's classmates, uh, uh, a boy named Tracy Lesh, who was a 14-year-old Lake Genevan local, you know, who, um, the, who he has to do these, these 24 panels to show you what, what you would see in the Tomb of Horrors. And it, sometimes it was... Um, an image that might have the scene and, and might have a clue in it for a, a player to kind of grip onto. Sometimes it was just the scene of a of a ignominious death happening to show you kind of how <laughs> how it went down when you went down the fire slide, that type of thing. But again, what what's so novel about it is that it was it was Gary and, and his partners thinking about how do we make this game uniform? How do we um, how do we make it a little bit more um, well, not just fair, but how do we make it more immersive? And, and that was kind of the first time they had done that in the. Um, the context of a module. Well, you mentioned miniatures, and that reminds me of how didn't they? They bought these just these packages of weird plastic monsters that they would use for <laughs> miniatures, and some of the things yeah. like monster. They're just like okay, you know, they're there's, just on these little random plastic toys. There's a couple of them, so it, the story has become a little confused because there's actually um, so basically there's this thing called prehistoric creatures that were put out, little Hong Kong plastic things, and yeah, the rust monster and the boule were in that. Um, and they were using them. And from a different set, there was something that would later be the um, a later version of the owlbear. Um, and then there were a couple other things in there that they used, but did not, as far as I know, get refined into kind of the recognizable monsters today. Um, Rust monsters and boulets are really easy to find on eBay. The owlbear is very difficult because it did come from this different set. Um, I've only seen one packaged example of it. Uh, Tony DiTrelizzi owns it. Um, that I'm aware of. Was um, was the plastic toy like a, a bear with an owl face or was it? No, more... it's actually a really, really crappy bootleg of a Japanese kaiju. I forget which one it is. <laughs> and it doesn't look anything like a bear. I mean, I guess it kind of looks like a bear with an owl. It's this 
sort of lizardy looking thing that's roughly bear shaped with a pointed snout and what look like kind of leaves on its head. Um, and it's based on a Japanese kaiju. Um, and uh, it doesn't look anything like the owl bear that Greg Bell drew, which looks like a bear with an owl's head. Right. Um, but when the AD and D monster manual came along and uh, Sutherland redrew the owl bear for it, that's what he used as his model. And cause that's, I guess that's what they were using at the gaming table. And uh, that's why the owl bear looks like this bizarro lizard that has sort of bear like proportions and a beak. It's completely strange. Um, but that's what it grew out of. And that remains one of my favorite owl bears of all time. Um, but um, yeah, it's nuts. And then for the boule, they had this thing. They didn't have any stats for it. They didn't have a name for it. They kind of made up this monster and they gave it to Tim Cask. And they said, listen, we need you to come up with the mechanics of this thing and we need a name for it. Um, and uh, Tim was the one who's like came up with this thing. It was kind of like a land shark because mm -hmm. Saturday Night Live and everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And as Tim as Tim describes it anyway, um, you know, they gave it a name They're like let's call it like a bullet. And then I guess he he said at the time giving things a French sounding name was the height of humor. Um, I'll take his word for it. And so they said, well, let's not call it a bullet. Let's call it a boule. Make it all fancy. And I guess that was uproariously humorous. Um, and that's how we ended up with the boule. And it's based on this wonky little plastic thing. And, and these little plastic toys, again, this is something that these early gamers, it, there was a very limited set of any type of miniatures you could you could get. So um, a lot of these people, um, like Gary, um, like Don Kay, his, his partner, uh, like Dave Arneson and uh, a number of other early gamers, they would they would take these things, they would modify these little toys to yeah. to be dragons and to be goblins and all these different things. So again, getting dime store plastic toys was a very very common thing for them to do, and it makes just as much sense that they would take them and they would inspire uh, the real D and D monsters that came later. Many of which had little descriptions or, or stat blocks before they were ever illustrated. But uh, as Brian mentioned, the um, uh, the not the rust monster, but the owl bear being a, a perfect example because Greg Bell had actually already illustrated a rust monster. I'm sorry, an owl bear rather in Greyhawk, which, yep. as he said, is a bear with an owl face, and um, you can see very clearly that somewhere between uh, when that comes out and when Dave Sutherland takes a crack at it for the monster manual, he has since seen the plastic um, uh, Hong Kong uh, toy and has based his drawing on on that piece. Which makes sense, because if they decided they wanted to use miniatures, especially coming out of their wargaming background, I mean, where are you going to find a bear with an owl head? <laughs> so I'm sure they just pulled this thing out, or at least I wouldn't be surprised to learn that they just pulled this thing out of the pile and someone was like, OK, boom, here's the owl bear. Good enough. You know, <laughs> just like I might grab a, a poker chip and be like, all right, here's the dragon you're fighting. It's what's there. And, you know, it, it kind of looks like a bear, kind of looks like an owl. Good enough. The fact that it survived and became the thing that was the basis of the owl bear for the next few years till easily, uh, I guess, redrew it is amazing to me because it's so bizarre looking. But and it's on the cover of the monster manual, too. Mm -hmm. That's the crazy thing. I mean, it's really they really love that thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so you mentioned that piece, the the paladin in hell. And I think one thing that's striking about that piece is that the the paladin is a completely realistic knight. I mean, I'm, it looks like somebody just looked at a picture of a knight and, and drew yeah. it into the, the, the thing. And in, in contrast to a lot of um, the fourth edition art, where the people have like gigantic shoulder pads and giants, you know, 10 foot wide swords and all this crazy stuff. Um and uh, I mean, Michael, in your book, you describe the fourth edition art as hyper stylized and mm -hmm. brash. Um, I'm not a, honestly a big fan of the fourth edition art. It kind of is too sort of superhero comic-y for me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do you guys share that that feeling? I well, Mike, you first. Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, so to not make a judgment, on it, I think it's actually some of the most interesting art that D&D ever rolled out. Yeah, um, I agree. The artists that were working on it were incredible. People like William O'Connor. Um, but I think what's notable about it is that you, the context, like everything else in this whole story, the context is really key. So what is D and D thinking about during that period? Well, they're thinking about world of Warcraft. They're thinking about MMOs and that entire fourth edition, uh, without being too long winded about it was really a reaction to trying to figure out how to engage players that were now used to these, um, first of all, these, these scenes that look like that, like, right? Like if you look at fourth edition art, 
that looks like that could be box game art for various, um, whether it be MMOs or, or computer role playing games or what have you. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing that's very important about it. It was also meant to be a, a multimedia play. Fourth edition was supposed to have, um, you know, an online component. It was supposed to have all kinds of, of different things attached to it. So they knew what they were doing in, in terms of trying to access these 10 million people that were playing World of Warcraft and a lot of other MMOs at the time. Um, but there's a number of other reasons why the edition kind of uh, fell flat. But again, done very deliberately, I think, for what it was trying to do, I think it was fairly successful. You also have to think about D&D is they're reflecting, like you're saying, what's out there, but that's not new. Easily, Elmore, Caldwell, Parkinson, that big shift to the Four Horsemen, that was reflecting what the, what was being seen on fantasy books and novels as they attempted to move into that market, as they were attempting to get into bookstores and into toy stores and out of hobby shops and mail order and stuff. So as fantasy art continues to evolve and change, D&D art is doing the same. Um, that early art was paving the way in, in, you know, like we interviewed Patrick Wilshire, who runs a convention called AluxCon. It's an art show. The top, top, top tier fantasy artists in the world are at this thing. And he pointed out when these guys were doing it, there was no there there yet. You know what I mean? There was no, this is what art is, what fantasy art is supposed to look like, because nobody knew yet what it was supposed to look like. These guys could pave that way. Well, by the time we reach fourth edition, fantasy art's everywhere. This is nothing new or different. Um, styles continue to evolve. They're pulling from anime. They're pulling from uh, comic books, like you said, all these different things. And I think D&D was just rolling with the stylistic times. I don't think it was anything... Uh, too out of the ordinary to do something like that. And I think um, while stylistically it's very different um, from the early stuff, the quality is off the charts. I mean, you have Wayne Reynolds, you have, like you said, Bill O'Connor, you have Scott Fisher, you have Todd Lockwood, um, you have, um, I mean, the list goes on. You have Christopher Burdett, you have uh, Steve Prescott. You have these great, great artists who were doing work at the time um, Raven, uh, Mora, uh, all this great stuff. Um, but again, keeping up with the times and for old school gamers, it was like, Oh, I don't know. But man, if you were a kid walking into, to, I don't know if Walden books still exist at that point, but walking into the bookstore and you see that book, if I was a kid and I walked in and saw some of those early books, I would have been like, Holy crap, the Beholder looks so badass now. I mean, with third edition, the Beholder suddenly got really mean looking. <laughs> um, the other thing you have to remember, with with uh, 3.5, you suddenly had the open gaming license and you had Paizo and you had Pathfinder. And Pathfinder was doing a lot of stuff with like Reynolds and things like that. And that was starting to eat into D&D. And I think D&D, TSR, uh, WotC... Uh, at the time, was aware of it. And you have to keep up with your competition. And at that point, Paizo was competition, like hardcore. Well, I guess one thing to say for the 4th edition art is that it does accurately reflect the tone of the 4th edition rule set, right? It would be <laughs> kind of weird if, uh, you know, like I mean, one of my favorite um, pieces of Dungeons & Dragons art, you actually have it in the documentary, it's at, a, at about minute 40, but it's this Larry Elmore piece. It's from the near the start of the second edition player's handbook, but there's this party of adventurers and there are, they've just killed this very small dragon. It's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's hanging from a tree and they're all, you know, they all look like normal people and their armor is all kind of dented and dirty. And yeah. they look, it's clearly been, you know, and they're all happy that they've um, succeeded. And, um, and that's always really captured dungeons and dragons for me. This like, you're with your friends and you know, you, you, you have these adventures together and, but they're, it's sort of like down to earth. And and that piece would not fit the fourth edition rule set. Like it would be weird if that were the cover of the fourth edition player's handbook. True. There's a dynamic to the art in later editions that you don't quite see in early editions. As dynamic as the early editions are, I mean, you look at um, the uh, the second edition. Um, ah, hell, uh, monster manual. No. Not that, uh, you know, where the, the the hill giant is fighting the 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 adventurer on the cover. It'll come uh, to uh, me. Monster That's Manual the Two. First. Monster Manual Two. Right, right, right. Thank you. Um, right, first edition Monster Manual Two. There's a lot of dynamic action there. You know, these are guys who had no problem with that. 
but it doesn't compare to the level of dynamic ja action, the amplified action that you see in later editions. But I think that's, again, reflective of the times. You know, I think it's what audiences expected from fantasy art. Um, just like when we brought in Elmore and all those guys, that's what audiences expected from fantasy art or would come to expect from fantasy art. It's a little shaky at the earliest days, but um, <laughs> reflective of the the most um, marketable at the time. Uh, Michael, do you have anything else you want to add to that? No, I, I think Brian's got that exactly right. I mean, again, fourth edition material uh, is is very expected in a lot of ways. It's consistent with what you would see in the market. And there was a lot of people that could do things that looked like that. And uh, D&D, again, was reacting to um, a much bigger market play that was play that was much more profitable. I mean, again, D&D has played the leader for many of its years. It's also played a follower in some of its years where uh, it sees a much bigger movement happening. It's trying to jump on board. Uh, in this particular case, it was reacting to a different style uh, and, frankly, to just the digital age where – all of a sudden, you've got people buying literally 10 times as many computer games of this or that, you know, that were in a lot of cases that were based on foundational com, uh, concepts developed by D&D. But D&D uh, &D is no longer capturing that market. Yeah. And that really starts to happen around, you know, well, third edition time going into 3.5 and then to fourth. That is exactly what that that game is reacting to. And the art really tells that story. The other big thing that I think it's important to mention D&D &D was no longer the go-to place for fantasy art. That was being seeded to Magic. Magic the Gathering put out way more fantasy art in any period of time than D&D &D was going to put out by then. You know, by then, however many cards are in a, a deck and however many sets they had by then, I mean, it was a mountain of fantasy art. And that's still the case today. I mean... Uh, it 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 was no longer this environment where it was D&D &D or book cover, like novel covers, and that was it. Um, plus, you had collected works. You started seeing museums. You just had the internet. You had all these other things. So D&D um, &D was in a much, much, much different place in terms of the, the role and influence their art was having on the, the larger landscape of fantasy art. Right. Well, it's interesting you bring up Magic the Gathering art, because in Michael's book, it says that D&D art is, quote, a collection simply unsurpassed in the fantasy genre, uh, a collection of art. And I was wondering if you get any pushback from uh, Magic the Gathering fans <laughs> on that. Uh, well, I mean, again, I, I think it's it's probably a tale of two cities. Uh, there is no question that the breadth and depth of Magic art is is extraordinary. Um, but they're also quite related. I mean, again, going back to the Again, this is a very interrelated story, and not just because Wizards is the group that ended out acquiring TSR and Dungeons & Dragons along with it in 1997. Um, when Magic came about, remember, you know, Richard Garfield uh, was a huge D&D fan. And even in his original prototype set, he had actually um, made copies and cut out piece, uh, images from the Monster Manual to put on his original uh, Magic cards. I didn't right? know that. That's set. awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a true story. <laughs> that's great. And, and so, again, from the very beginning, these things are, are really um, intermingled. So what I might say is we could argue all day about what has a uh, uh, the greater breadth and depth of art. Um, but what I would say is that the influence of D&D art, going back to the very beginning, that without D&D, there is certainly no magic. And there's also not a lot of other things out there uh, because D&D laid the foundation in a way that that this became the foundational place you looked when you were trying to find uh, monsters or imagery of, of various fantasy settings, especially in, a, in the world of gaming. Uh, and that's where Richard Garfield looked when he was building these sets. Um, and again, the rest is kind of history. But what's notable, actually, in that whole thing is, you know, when Magic took off and, and that had a when Magic came to the market, unlike D&D, &D, which actually had pretty steady growth over a number of years, uh, Magic catapulted in, in, onto the scene and actually very quickly ate everybody's lunch. In the fantasy gaming world, uh, so much so that so many of the things that TSR was doing in the 1990s um, was a reaction to magic, whether it had to do with collectible card games. TSR tried to enter that market as well, or whether it just had to do with how D&D uh, &D was was reacting to this this incredible craze. Because, again, it's eating the same bucket of money of most consumers. Right. Instead of playing your new Dark Sun campaign or your, your new Dark Sun module, you instead go buy a booster pack for magic, right? So it became a very different conversation. 
Um, and so by 1997, um, TSR, among a lot of its competitors, were kind of choked out of the market, largely because people had gravitated so much to magic and different fantasy games. Um, so, again, it's uh, I guess that's a long way of saying that these are very interrelated stories and they both have a great collection of art. I'll just leave it there. And, you know, they also use a lot of the same artists, um, especially today, um, you know, easily did magic cards and mm -hmm. Todd Lockwood did magic cards and Brom did magic cards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bill O'Connor did magic cards, Chris Burdett, Steve Prescott. Um, all these guys did magic cards, um, and do, did or do D and D art. Um, so I think you eventually reach a point. Wayne Reynolds certainly did both, um, and was doing Paizo stuff. I mean, he was everywhere. Um, I think you reach a point where, it becomes harder and harder to talk about fantasy art in terms of one particular thing, because you see the same artists cropping up again and again and again. Sometimes they shift their styles slightly to fit whatever the particular uh, client is, but not always and not often that much. So you ultimately end up with this kind of great uh, giant pool of simply fantasy art. And, um, but that, I think, like Mike said, gets traced directly back to D and D in terms of uh, popular um, and mainstream impact. And and I agree with him. If you're talking about it from just sheer impact of it all, I mean D and D, and maybe as a standalone, Frank Frazetta. I mean, he's this weird kind of thing that you can just simply never get away from. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I I'll, I'll say this to, to append that. Um, again, one thing that's very interesting, if you look at how those things have existed alongside each other, and again, Wizards of the Coast being where they come together, right? Wizards yeah. is the producer of Magic the Gathering. It's also becomes the owner of D&D &D in 97. What I think is really interesting is if you look at where D&D &D goes, um, Wizards, the first edition they put out, of course, is third edition in 2000. And what I think is so fascinating is look at the covers of third edition. They're not traditional fantasy art, and they're nothing like what you would see in Magic the Gathering. They're in-world tones, yes. right? So even that is a really interesting study in and of itself about how once Wizards got a hold of these, how they felt like they probably needed to differentiate uh, even between these, these different brands. Well, so I want to say that, you know, the, the most recent iteration of Dungeons & Dragons is the 5th edition. So I'm just curious to get your guys' thoughts on what do you think of the 5th edition art um, as compared to the earlier editions? I love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think it's different. You know, styles change. It doesn't have the hyper-saturated colors and, and brightness that you see in a lot of the old stuff. But I, I don't like comparing and contrasting the art uh, in, a, in, a, in a qualitative sense because I think it's all good. I mean, we talk about the rough stuff early on. That Even that makes me a little uncomfortable to describe it that way. Uh, it's not rough. It's just different. I mean, you look at someone like Jim Rosloff from the earliest days, his stuff is, is astonishing. Um, so I, I like to, I sort of tread lightly in this area, but that said, I love it. Um, I think there's a lot of um, creativity there. I think there's a lot of um, sort of pushing things in directions that we didn't see at the same time. It throws back a little to an older style. Things are a little bit more reserved than they were uh, in fourth edition. Um, I think we're seeing, and, and this is sort of a, a something you can apply to D&D &D in general, a greater diversity of representation um, in this thing. So you're seeing, you're no longer seeing just sort of like, you know, white men as fighters, you know, they're, they're picking different colors, different genders, all sorts of different things to make a concerted effort to represent the entire gaming community. Um, and I think that's wonderful. So I think there's a lot going on that is just great. The monsters are awesome. The first thing I always do when I flip through a new monster manual is see how they've treated the classics and, and mm -hmm. my favorites. And I'm always like, okay, is this where I finally hurl a book through a window? Cause I'm so pissed <laughs> off, but I love it. You know, Bryn Matheny's owl bear is based on the design drawings of Steve Prescott. And I think it's great. Um, I love her carrying crawler as well. Um, you know, the dragons, I think, are all excellent. Um, uh, 
you know, building off of Todd Lockwood's dragon. So you, with mm-hmm. Todd, you shifted away from dragons that looked almost like human skeletal structures with shoulders and, and thumbs to a more animalistic look, a more cat-like look in terms of structure. And they've continued with that. Um, which well, and I think you is show fun. They, they do the anatomical drawings with the musculature and everything. Yep, yep, yep. And that's something that a lot of the monster artists are doing today. Um, something that Todd did early on. They're really looking at the anatomy. Like, how do we make this thing as realistic as possible without trying to make it, you know, boring? Um, so all those things are coming together. Um, I think the art's just great. I, I really dig it. Yeah, the, the fifth edition stuff is uh, for I me. Mean, for one thing, what's so striking about it to me is that it's so aligned with the edition. That, that is one thing I, I would say is that fifth edition is the most aligned edition that D and D has ever had when it comes to that art. It completely matches what it's done with the design of the game. It's got something for old schoolers. It's got something for new schoolers. Um, it's diverse. It shows that you can be whatever you want to be, and as Brian suggested. Um, they've gone to, you, you know, they, they've really, you know, put a lot of effort into making sure that this game um, looks like it, that anybody can play it. And you, you do not need to live into these old preconceptions of, of what we thought was kind of this Conan the Barbarian feel of the game. Um, and, you know, by the way, that effort really started uh, when Wizards took over. The third edition is really the first edition that really dove deep into this idea of making sure the game was for everybody, that it was diverse. It was the first edition, for example, that um, well, it did a few things. It actually kind of broke the barriers about um, class limitations. Now you could be a half-orc paladin, something you could never do before. Yeah. And that was, again, that was a bigger signal to the audience of the game that, no, you can be whatever you want to be in Dungeons & Dragons. You're not, you're not limited here. Um, it, it also, again, began to illustrate um, classes. It, it would kind of have a male and a female version of the different class illustrations, which was really important. Um, so I, I should say the, the race illustrations, not the class illustrations. Um, so it, again, it really started to um, to really break a lot of boundaries, and they've really kept going that direction. At this point, the fifth edition art—I mean, I just think it's extraordinary. It doesn't look like anything else that D and D has ever done. Um, it, it has just this kind of um, ethereal quality about it, all of it. And again, it's all by different artists doing different things, and it continues to be very diverse art. And I mean, in, in its style, but yeah, and it just so many—it's so dynamic, it's so interesting. It. The, the, the new takes on the old concepts and the old villains and the old modules, I just think it's so refreshing and, and beautiful. It's it's certainly very high on my list, among my favorite, if not my favorite, outright. I mean, I, I own a few pieces of original art from from a couple different editions of D&D, uh, including first edition. But some of my favorite pieces are some of the modern ones, you know, um, I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at the Goblin from the fifth edition Monster Manual. I'm looking at... Uh, the Hobgoblin. I'm looking at the Ogre Hucker from, uh, <laughs> crap, I can't remember which. But anyway, um, and they're sitting right next to a Keith Parkinson painting that I have or a Jim Rossloff <laughs> drawing that I have from Deities and Nemigods. Um, and it's, it all, look, it's always going to change. Art is always going to evolve within a genre. And what makes D&D art so fantastic is that it all, feels like D&D art. Tony D. Terlizzi, very mm-hmm. distinct style. Brahm, very distinct style. Elmore and Easley, distinct styles, but of a more sort of traditional fantasy look. But it all feels like D&D. And I think that's what makes it special. That That's what makes it this thing we can talk about without it just being, oh, a discussion of fantasy art. There's something there. There's the storytelling, you know, that's always been key to D&D art. Um, this idea that you can look at it and it's not just, I mean, sure, you have a posed picture of a knight, so you know what a knight looks like or a fighter or magic user or whatever you want it to be. But so much of the art tells you a story in one frame, all these little things that make it D&D art. And, and that's what makes it so special. That's what I think keeps us coming back to it and, and enjoying it no matter when it was created or what edition or anything like that. Well, and, you know, you mentioned, it, Brian, a couple of my absolute favorites, Dieter Lisi, absolutely, Brahm, absolutely. Um, and the idea of telling that story in one picture. And to me, I, I will say, I grew a, new, a completely new appreciation for a number of these early artists, partly because the way that the art has been reproduced over the years, they simply couldn't do a great reproduction of a lot of this really early stuff on the front of these old, you know, AD&D books. Uh, when we actually had a chance to see the original canvases and, and photograph them uh, at high res, uh, 
it changed everything. And yeah. the one that I wanted to mention, I wanted to give some love to Dave Trampier, yeah. uh, who, who passed away a few years ago. So I'm convinced at this point, this is going to sound radical, but I'm convinced at this point that he was an artistic genius. And I say that not because he uh, could execute, um, I'm going to use John Peterson's words here. Trampier um, was not on a technical level, the most gifted artist. He clearly didn't have the greatest training, but he clearly was trying to paint the music in his head. You can see it in everything he did, that, that the ambition along what he was trying to do was extraordinary. And I will point people to, if you've never seen the wraparound cover for the Dungeon Master screen that Trampier did, yeah. it is unbelievably cinematic. It is as great as any movie poster you would have seen in the early 80s. Now, again, execution wasn't his necessarily his strong suit because, again, he wasn't as trained as some of these later artists. But Trampier, when you look at the things he was trying to do, you don't need to look very f far to see that this guy was a genius. I agree. And he was one of the artists who could execute in a lot of different styles. Um, the piece you just talked about is this, it feels like a movie poster. Um, and then you look at the, um, the player's handbook cover, but then you look at some of his interior black and whites and they almost mm -hmm. look like iconographic kind of symbolic types of pieces, you know, that would make great tattoos. Um, you know, you look at his stone giant, which is great. Um, Beautiful. you know, he, he, he could do so much. Um, and whether the, the technical precision and execution was always up to the level of some of the other artists was almost irrelevant because there is a consistency with his work. There was a stylistic uh, voice with his work that you saw also with Jim Rosloff. Jim Rosloff yes. is someone who I hold up as one of the absolute best artists and one of the most unsung artists in Dungeons and Dragons he had a number of different styles, his line work, his ability to use ink and weight and to create these dynamic, energetic drawings uh, always blew my mind as a kid um, and today still do. Um, these are guys who who could. They had a vision and uh, and, and, a, and a sense of of artistry that just made their stuff exciting. You know, made it cool. Like, here's the thing. We're, we're talking about it in these academic terms. Let's be real. The stuff is just freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. It's cool. You want to take it and stick it on your wall, not because you're going to walk like the curator of a museum through your place, but because it's freaking awesome. And you can stare at it and go, man, that dragon is just badass. Like, I think it's it's we have 40 years of looking at this art. And sometimes the danger is you become too academic with it. Right. You know, in the end, it's just cool. Right. Stuff that makes you daydream, right? You look at those Planescape drawings and you just yeah. think that the possibilities in those things, what's happening in the background of that crazy Tony DiTerlisi painting. Uh, again, a lot of that stuff, watercolor, so interesting. It's n like nothing d, d had ever seen. Oh, and yeah. At the end of the day, what were these people trying to do? Well, they were trying to they were trying to create possibilities. They were trying to create a world of do it yourself uh, you know, dreamers and players, that's the whole nature of the game. And uh, it's, it's an amazing thing about how the art has supported that mission now for 45 years. I also just want to ask both of you just about the logistics of, of doing these different projects. I mean, like, uh, Michael, yeah. um, I've heard you say, I, like, your book is an officially licensed Wizards of the Coast product. And I've heard you say that it would have been impossible to do it without that. Could you just talk about what the practical um, aspects were of, of putting together a book like this? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, that aspect of the project was is not to be ignored. While it may not be as interesting as, as some other parts of it, but so right. So starting with the licensure of it, right? You couldn't, you simply just couldn't print these images in a book like this without the um, the permission of Wizards for starters. Um, but um, so that was that was kind of one element of it. But of course, there was there was many separate elements in terms of how this all worked because. Part of it was getting the imagery, right? Um, Wizards, first of all, gave us unprecedented access to their archive, which was just incredible. Um, but a lot of the earliest stuff, let's say the pre-1985 stuff, um, had really since dispersed to the four corners of the earth. So there was this whole archaeology project and even finding where these things were, uh, tracking them down and then getting them photographed at, at high resolution so that we could, we could print them in the book. So that was one element. Again, that's consider that that's intellectual property still owned by Wizards of the Coast, but they don't actually have a capture of it, or at least one that that is good enough to, to go ahead and print. So that was a distinct um, element of the, the project that was really pretty exciting, but 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 daunting as well. And then there's this other element of, of licensing images separately, which, again, 
when you want to tell the whole story of Dungeons and Dragons, there's a lot of things that are, are very much part of the story that are not actually D and D IP. So consider like when you want to show um, uh, an ad from TV guide with Tom Hanks and mazes and monsters. Well, you, that's not D and D's permission. That's somebody else's permission, right? When you want to show a New York times article where the James Dallas Egbert, the third incident happened, which of course was really the start of the controversies around the game that led to the satanic panic. Uh, when you want to show that that's not within, you know, D and D's uh, within wizards IP. So um, it was really important for us to capture the entire visual story kind of soup to nuts. And a lot of those things actually come from outside the wizard's umbrella. So that, that was really our mission was we wanted to capture the entire visual story from beginning to end, uh, along with all of the ancillary pieces. And, and I, I think we, we did a pretty good job of doing it. How about Brian? Were you working with wizards or how, how does that no. documentary? Um, it's so there, <laughs> it's funny listening to sort of Michael's um the stuff that you had to jump through to make this happen, um, you know, and, and I understand a lot of that. I worked in magazine journalism for a long time um, before switching over to video and film work. Um, you know, we we reached out to Wizards early on because we wanted to interview some people. We wanted to interview someone at Wizards who said, I would love to talk to you. That's great. I can't do it without permission, though, corporate permission. So we reached out. We kind of got redirected to Hasbro's um pr departments and they were like well good luck on your movie but we we're gonna choose to not uh participate actively but you know good luck have fun i was like okay great well that's that um which is funny because later on we did get don murren who's an art director over at uh magic the gathering but for a long time she was the art director um at uh dungeons and dragons and she basically said to her her bosses over at Wizards, look, I want to do this. And they're like, okay, go here, have fun. Um, so I'm not quite sure how that came together. But for things like the imagery and stuff like that, you know, we lean heavily on uh, the journalistic foundation for fair use. So there are things we can get away with as documentary makers that we would never be able to get away with if we were publishing a book. Um, as long as we are, there's a long precedent for um, a fair use argument, as long as we're discussing this stuff, we can show this stuff. Um, that's how it works. That's how the news gets away with it. That's how documentaries are often able to do it, as long as we're not incorporating it into our own intellectual property and things like that. Um, we worked very closely with a corporate and IP lawyer to make sure that we were not uh, stepping out of bounds. One of our partners on the film, Seth Polanski, um, is both our lawyer and strangely enough, our sound engineer. It's a <laughs> weird group when you make indie movies. Um, my other partner, I should just say is Kelly Slagle. Um, she's co-director, co-producer, but also our editor on the movie. So we all put our heads together to make sure that we could get away with this. So we, you know, fair use is a tricky thing. It's based on, on precedent. It's based on a court's sort of ultimate decision. There are no hard and fast rules for fair use. But we knew in this case we were on pretty safe ground. Um, but we did run into the same problem that Michael did where you need this art. You know, you have to get this art. And we lucked out. Um, a lot of it, a lot of it is owned by a collector um, in Hong Kong who graciously let us use high res photos. So like the player's handbook, the Trampier, we had an incredibly high res photo of that given to us um, where we could see the actual brush strokes. I mean, it was insane. Um, bigger than my computer monitor when I did looked at it one to one. Um, so for a lot of the art, we were able to get stuff like that um, to get access to it because we couldn't dig into the archives. Um, but, you know, we're also talking a lot about a lot of the art in the context of product. So we just held up the product, you know, or we'd reach out to the artists and if they still had some, we'd have them talking about their art. Um, it was difficult. I would not have minded having wizards behind <laughs> us on this thing. But honestly, on the other hand, one of the things that is nice about doing an independent film is you have complete creative control. And that was important to us. That said, we were going in as a celebration of this art and a celebration of everything. So, um, you know, I like to think that I, I know we are on wizard's radar at this point and, you know, it, that's nice. Um, and, uh, hopefully they, they'll like the film when it comes out. I think they will. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's all complicated. Do you ever just 
stand there in amazement at how perfect the title Eye of the Beholder is for a Dungeons and Dragons art movie. It's like the whole history of the world converged to make that happen. And I appreciate you saying that because uh, I came up with that title. And uh, <laughs> so I'm glad uh, I'm glad you like it. The tricky part is there are a number of monsters in Dungeons and Dragons that are that are actually intellectual property of Wizards of the Coast. Um, and the Beholder is one of them. So we were a little hesitant at first to use it as a title because how do you use it as a title but not show a Beholder in your own logo, you know, in your intellectual property, which is a definite no-no, um, despite fair use and everything else. Can't do that. Um, Eye of the Beholder itself was totally cool because it's a common phrase, has to deal with art. So yes, like you said, perfect. Um, and then we just kind of looked around and we realized, well, every other company in the world has their version of the Beholder and they do it by changing what the thing looks like. And uh, we kind of played with the idea of what a Beholder looks like um, for our logo until our lawyer said, OK, now you are safe. Um, hmm. But yeah, we were we were really happy with that title from the beginning. Um, we lucked out. We lucked out that that's a common phrase. <laughs> I was just curious, Brian, um, are there other documentary, are there any similar documentaries to this one? I mean, I watched one called um, Painting with Fire that's about, about Frank Frazetta that I thought was really good. But are, are there any other sort of fantasy art documentaries out there that you know of? Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember any titles, um, but there are a few out there. Like you said, Painting with Fire is certainly one of the awesome ones. Um, but there's nothing that looks at D and D art or zeros in on the D and D ness of it all, which is why we did it. You know, it's there were some things in the works on the history of Dungeons and Dragons, and there's a whole long story there that I won't even bother getting into. <laughs> but um, which is why I originally thought, okay, well, I'm not sure I want to go in that direction, but nobody's doing something on the art. Like I said, Diesel early on. I was in a conversation with some filmmakers and they were sort of surprised at the notion that maybe they should include a conversation about the art. I said, well, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to talk about this thing that was so important to me over all these years. And, um, and part of it was there wasn't anything else out there, you know, just, you know, like I look at, at Michael's book and it just blows me away. Um, I, I saw a copy of it at, um, at Comic-Con this weekend, last weekend. And uh, I was talking to another person who worked for Diamond Select who had an early edition. So I was flipping through it there. And in the past, there have been a lot of D&D art books, like simply the art of Dungeons and Dragons. And here's a picture and maybe a caption, maybe a quote from an artist. Um, I love the fact that, Michael, you guys decided to do a visual history of the game and, you know, use the art to tell this story. Um, cause I haven't seen that before. I haven't seen any comprehensive interviews with the artists before, except for a few that crop up in, in old issues of Dragon Magazine. They would interview mm -hmm. old TSR employees. Um, these things hadn't been done. And I think, uh, I find that surprising to a certain extent. And then when I look at how much work went into it, I now understand why nobody else was crazy enough to do either of these things. <laughs> it's well, just, as it's you suggested, I think. Thank you for those comments. I mean, that's, uh, that's, it's really nice. And I, I, again, we're, we were thrilled with how it, how it came together and we did not know what we were getting into on many levels. Uh, we knew some things. We knew we could execute certain pieces that would be high value to the market. Um, we knew where, for example, a few of those original AD and D wrapper, wraparound covers existed. We knew that Wizards had the original Sutherland basic box painting. You know, there was a few things like this. And, and John in particular, uh, being a collector as he is, I had a really good, you know, sense of um, a lot of things that we could access. A good example, you know, we know the gentleman who has kind of the best collection of product, pristine product. Um, so yeah. things like that, we knew we could we could put something together. What ended up happening was a very different story, um, a level of, of again, that we, we use the term archaeology, right? Uh, this notion of archaeology as you're, you're kind of just keep lifting rocks and seeing what's there. And eventually you, you end up tripping on things you never thought you'd find and, and other things that we didn't know existed. I, I point you to something that I know Brian shows in his film and, and something we were thrilled to get our hands on. This, uh, this kind of ground beholder, this draft uh, kind of looking something between a, a beholder and a roper that Greg Bell had originally drawn for, for Greyhawk that Gary rejected. And as Gary's hand, uh, hand annotations next to it, it says, no, don't use. Uh, and 
you know, the context of the fact that this was all homebrew. No one knew they were making history when they did this stuff. And so here's draft material from that history, stuff that it's a miracle that it exists, that they didn't throw it away. Um, to be able to unearth things like that and then to be able to find and, and provide a contextual story around how this all came together, that was some of the most meaningful stuff that we did. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a huge honor to do it. And, um, and I think the big picture, again, we had that early conversation about, do we do an art book where we kind of, you know, arbitrarily show a bunch of art and, and say, here it is, or do we try to tell a story? Do we try to tell a, uh, the story of D and D as told through its visuals, which is a very different story. If you think about not just art, but advertising, um, ephemera products, uh, toys, licensed stuff, all these things that have affected the visual history of the game. And we realized you could really tell the story of D&D &D very well if you just looked at those visuals. So that was that was the goal. And hopefully we we achieved that. One of the things that you guys did that we did that I, you know, I was so happy to get a hold of. And then I'm flipping through your book. I'm like, oh, you guys have it, too. Awesome. The there's um, instances of art where we have the early pencil drawings of whatever that piece of art might be. And then we have the final piece of art mm -hmm. and being able to show that process a little bit. Um, I think is great because I think a lot of people look at it and don't understand the kind of alchemy that has to come together to end up with a final piece of art. So to be able to look at one of Jim Rosloff's pencils for, you know, Keep of the Borderlands and then the cup and how that transitions into the final um, Keep of the Borderlands is really cool. I know as as a fan, I mean, I think we're all fans that that <laughs> helps. Um, but as a fan, you look at it, you go, well, that's just awesome. That's really cool and insightful and something that I hadn't experienced before as someone who just bought the module. Um, so it's neat to be able to bring that to other people. You know, it, I joke that the whole point of making this movie was so I could go hang out with all these artists and get to talk <laughs> to them. And, you know, I might as well hit record on the camera so other people can, too. Um, <laughs> but to a certain extent, that's kind of true. You know, I want to meet these people. And the thinking is, well, other people probably want to meet them also. So let's go make this movie. Let's go get all these people on camera talking about this stuff so that it's not going to be as comprehensive a picture of D&D &D as a whole that, you know, the book is by any means. Um, but it's going to be um, a chance to meet people that unless you go to a million conventions, you're not going to get to meet. Um, and uh, we thought that might be fun. Yeah, like you, Brian, we we wrote and made the book that we wanted to buy, right? Yeah, we approached it as fans. Uh, you made the movie that you wanted to to buy and watch, and we uh, we made the book that we wanted to read and, and buy. So yeah, and again, I, I think um, I think there's an audience out there these days that are are really interested in in what this whole story is because it's an amazing story and one that that really hasn't been told. Yeah, I like Michael that you refer to all this Dungeons and Dragons art as pristine product. It sounds like Breaking Bad or something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It's addictive, man. It's it's not too far from the truth, especially if you collect this stuff. Oh, oh. man. You will never have a drug habit because you won't have any money to spend on drugs. <laughs> it's true. Well, and again, finding things from 1974 or whatever that were, were effectively unused, you know, people that have this stuff in perfect condition, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that any of this stuff still exists. You know, there was a thousand original brown boxes, first printing, that were assembled by Gary and his family. And... um you know, and we happen to know the gentleman who owns the, the most perfect copy in, in existence right now, you know, to be able to scan that version or, or, or again, again, when we couldn't get uh, perfect products, sometimes we had something better. A good example is, you know, the addition of Chainmail that we feature in the book was Gary's personal play copy of Chainmail with his name on, on the front. You know, uh, even showing imagery like that and showing uh, that particular capture uh, it adds, I think, a level of depth and, and kind of fun to the whole experience. You know, the problem yeah, is, I, I was just going to say, you know, you talk about finding the stuff. So much of it was destroyed. TSR tossed a whole bunch of it mm -hmm. and a few people rescued it, some of it at the time. But, you know, a lot of it just simply doesn't exist anymore. And a lot of the stuff that does exist, you know, these artists were selling it at conventions for like 40 bucks, 50 bucks. I mean, the most amazing pieces of art that sell today for thousands yep. were just set up at conventions. You buy them for, you know, whatever's in your wallet. Um, and kind of gets spread to the winds. Luckily, a few big collectors have amassed a lot of it. So if you can hook up with them, you can find a lot of it. But coming across this stuff today is really, really difficult. It's either destroyed or locked up in in sort of black hole collections. 
Um, so it makes it it makes it tricky, like you say, art art art. Yeah, I can't even say that archaeology, <laughs> but with the word archaeology, arts. yes, it's, thank you. It's not Good a real word, but, but we archaeology it was yeah. Well, yeah, and I just totally want to agree with what Brian said earlier about, you know, that we can be as academic as we want about this, but that it is just awesome. And I mean, I, I totally I felt that both watching this documentary and reading this book. I mean, it was just thrilling. Uh, you know, I just felt like I was flying. And uh, it, it's just it's just so exciting. I mean, I think that anyone who has any like even the most tangential interest in Dungeons and Dragons is going to want to read this book and going to want to watch this documentary. Um, so everyone definitely check those out. Um, and we are, uh, we're pretty much out of time. So I think we'll have to wrap things up there. Uh, but so we've been speaking with Michael Whitwer, co-author of Art and Arcana and Brian Stillman, co-director of Eye of the Beholder. So thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Michael Whitwer and Brian Stillman for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Ben Kerrigan, who just made a one-time contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to Ben and to everyone else who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Zach Hanselin and Todd Vanderwerf for sponsoring today's show. Check out their new book, Monsters of the Week, the complete critical companion to the X-Files, over at abramsbooks.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.